so um, so so Romil actually Romil Dave needs uh, needs no introduction, but let me give a, a brief introduction anyway while he sets up. Um, so Romil uh, uh, got his PhD at the University of Santa Cruz actually, um, and uh, since then he has been a, um, a Lyman Spitzer Fellow at Princeton, a Hubble Fellow at uh, University of Arizona, and then a faculty member at the University of Arizona, uh, and then. Uh, went on to um, uh, become a research chair at, uh, at uh, Cape Town University uh, and has just uh, re very recently taken up um, a faculty uh, uh, position at, um, uh, at Edinburgh, University of Edinburgh. Uh, and in fact, I think that's where he flew in from today, <laughs> this morning. Um, but um, he is also, I should also say, he's a, a, a real expert in... Um, in uh, the use of computational right. methods no to connect right. galaxy formation Good. to cosmology. So we've asked him to give sort of an opening talk, um, which yeah. lays out some of the basic questions and, and, uh, and issues that, um, uh, that we want to face, okay, so that we want to uh, deal with during this conference, but also um, we, we're going to give him, so we've asked him to give the very first lecture of the sequence, <coughs> but we've also asked him to give it the very last. So he's going to bring everything together at the end and tell us um, what we know and what we don't know. And with that, here's okay. Ramil. Excellent. Well, uh, welcome, everyone. Um, <coughs> so yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me to this, to this lovely um, summer school. I think it's going to be really interesting and exciting. And um, so yeah, as, as Greg mentioned, I'm going to sort of start off with an overview of some of what I think are the interesting uh, aspects of galaxy formation. A lot of it is going to be a little bit of a review of you know, the, the basic framework. First, I'm going to uh, start with a little more observationally oriented stuff, since I'm such an expert on that, and then move on to uh, a little bit more um, computationally oriented things. So, <clears throat> But basically, this is aimed at the students here. Okay, so this is for you guys, <laughs> uh, not so much for all the senior people who are, who are, who are gonna kibitz and, and tell me how I'm doing everything wrong which, uh, and, and saying wrong things, but please feel free to do that as well. But, uh, but I want you guys to, to you know, ask questions. Uh, this is, I really like this to be much more of a discussion than me lecturing for some ungodly amount of time, like an hour and a half or something, okay? That's not gonna be so much fun for any of us. So please interrupt me and we can discuss stuff. I have a ton of slides, but I don't feel the need to go through all of them, okay? Um, okay, great. So let's, I guess I have to use this, maybe, or not, okay. That was the one you know. Okay, now my thing is totally frozen here. Let's see what happened. I might have to. need to use the clicker since the thing is on. All right, let's see. Oh yeah, okay, cool. Great, I think, I think we're fine. Okay, cool. Right, so yeah, brief outline of what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, just very briefly introducing the problem. I think we're all sort of aware of what galaxy evolution is, but just so we're on the same page of the various things that, that go into the formation and evolution of galaxies. Uh, talk a little bit about the various components of galaxies and, and how, we might, how we go about observing them and what are some of the key things that we as, as modelers have to think about you know, connecting our models to the observations and what, what is gonna be the, the key aspects of that. Um, then sort of get into a little bit of the meat of it, the, the modern uh, way of looking at galaxy formation, which I'll try to argue is a little bit um, uh, changed over you know, what you might have learned in a similar school 20 years ago, or maybe even 10 years ago, maybe. Uh, and, <coughs> and, and then focus on a couple of specific areas that I think are particularly interesting. One is uh, the role of, of black holes in galaxy evolution and what we can understand about AGN, uh, and also the circumgalactic medium, 
which I think is one of the most exciting new aspects and uh, one of the frontiers of this sort of uh, galaxy, from galaxy evolution studies, both observationally and theoretically, in the coming years. Okay, so yeah, as I said, please ask questions. All right, so galaxy formation, right? It's basically an initial condition problem. Okay, this is our initial condition, right? And people argue about the exact cosmological parameters and stuff, like, but as galaxy formation people, we don't care, right? I mean, to, it's basically, you know, to the uncertainties now on cosmological parameters are such that galaxy formation uncertainties far, far outweigh that. Okay, so that's our initial conditions. We know that. This is the final state, right? When we go out and observe something, like uh, with, with Hubble, and we see all these little blobby things, they're highly nonlinear and they're very diverse. So that's the whole problem of getting from A to B. That's galaxy formation. And as you probably know, it involves a, a wide range of physical processes, right? So we have to think about cosmology, uh, but you know, essentially in terms of the growth of structure and how that might uh, lead to the, the, the correlations in galaxies that we see across large scale structure. But then we get into sort of all the, the microphysical stuff, which is really where a lot of the interesting aspects of galaxy formation lie. Obviously, galaxies are made of stars, so we have to know how stars form, we have to know how they evolve, what the evolution, the end products of those evolution, like supernovae, end up doing to the surrounding gas, uh, chemical enrichment, the nature of dark matter might be something that uh, could, could play a role, although I'm not gonna talk about that too much, and then black hole, black hole feedback, uh, as well as uh, feedback from star formation. So essentially, you know, as a galaxy formation theorist, you know, as, as you students move up in the, in the world, what you're gonna have to do is really be kind of, you know, a dilettante-ish about a astronomy knowledge, right? There's, you, you're really gonna have to learn a lot about a lot of different things. I mean, I never thought I'd have to knew any, know anything about thermally pulsating AGB stars, okay? <laughs> I mean, what the heck, right? I, I'm, a, I'm a someone who writes code, right? So, uh, so that, that's the kind of thing that, that you know, pay attention, right? L learn about all the stuff that's going on because you just never know. Y you'd be surprised how often it's gonna be useful. So, you know, we're gonna basically try to combine all these elements, and, th and the reason for that, of course, is galaxy formation sits as sort of a nexus, uh, a, a crossroads of many different areas of study. Right? And I put these arrows in both directions specifically because our understanding of galaxy formation then feeds back on something like cosmology. Right? If you want to do precision cosmology, you have to uh, deal with the uncertainties in your galaxy formation uh, to, to learn more about cosmology and so on and so forth. Right? So, <coughs> so this is really a two-way street and it's, it's why galaxy formation is really one of the most active and, and biggest areas in, the, in astronomy today. Okay, so that was basically the introduction. So, well, this is sort of still a little bit of the introduction. I think the, the you know, to sort of introduce talking about galaxy formation, we, we kind of have to go back to the 1920s, uh, to the old Hubble sequence, right? And we still talk about this. Why do we still talk about this? I mean, isn't this like, you know, 90 years old now? Who cares, right? Well, who cares whether galaxies are shaped differently? Well, it turns out the reason this is interesting is because the morphology of these galaxies, whether they're spirals or ellipticals or what shape they are, you know, how tight the spirals are wound, not so much the barred stuff that turned out to be less fundamental, but, but just going left and right on the Hubble sequence there correlates with a huge number of other aspects of galaxies. And, right, and this is what makes galaxy formation kind of interesting uh, that, you know, as pro again, probably most of you are aware, you know, the, the ellipticals tend to be red and dead. Uh, there's this red sequence uh, that's, that's sort of distinct from this so-called blue cloud of, uh, of star-forming galaxies. So you have the, the passive galaxies up here. You have a lack of galaxies in this green valley area. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the big galaxies tend to be at the massive end. So we think because, you know, because things grow hierarchically, that means that things are moving from the blue cloud onto the red sequence somehow. Um, <coughs> the, the, the red sequence galaxies or the elliptic early type galaxies tend to live in dense regions, they're more clustered, uh, and there's a lot of X-ray gas around those galaxies. Whereas if you look at the blue ones, there's very little X-ray gas, surprisingly little X-ray gas actually in, in many cases, and they tend to live in more uh, poor group or, or field type environments. So, <coughs> and then, you know, you have other things like dust, you won't go into all the things, uh, you know, and these tend to have fairly large black holes, Whereas these, you know, can have a range of black hole masses, but tend to be relatively more modest. So it's basically this 
that we as galaxy formation modelers have to understand where this all comes from, right? We want to know, like if we see a spiral galaxy of a certain mass at a certain redshift, what was its typical history? What was its particular history, right? These things are all sorts of things that, that we want to be able to understand where things came from individually. Obviously our Milky Way is a case example that's, that's particularly of interest to us, but in general, we want to know both how the population evolves as well as how individual galaxies can come to look the way they do. Okay, so how do we go about um, observing it? Well, you know, we have the light. That's all we have, really. So we try to, until, you know, gravity waves start to really, uh, you know, tell us stuff. So we have the light, so here's the, uh, an example SED from, from galaxies, from a particular galaxy, this is M82. You know, you're probably familiar with a, a nearby starburst galaxy. So <clears throat> what I just wanted to highlight is you know, all the various aspects that we have to consider uh, when we're modeling galaxies. And we have to think about what is the emission in each of these sort of bands, uh, wavelengths, what is it coming from, how much is there, uh, and what is it doing, right? So, <clears throat> um, so for instance, for, for, the, for this particular galaxy, well, for any galaxy, really, um, you know, you have the young stars, the OB stars, the things that go supernovae, the things that, you know, distribute the, the uh, the chemical um, elements around, so on and so forth. <coughs> you know, those are, of course, very blue, very hot young stars. Uh, typically, you don't see that blue light because most of it is absorbed by dust and, and radiated back out here, right? But in many different ways. So you can have, you know, dust uh, essentially reprocessed light in the H2 regions, in the photo dissociation regions, so on and so forth. This is the, the oranges from the old stars. Right, so basically, once you get above maybe something like you know, um, uh, you know, 800 0.8 microns or something like that, you know, typically or one micron, you start to be dominated by the old stars rather than by the 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 OB stars. Right, so that's that's why basically, if we want to talk about things with stellar mass, we try to look at wavelengths, rest frame wavelengths greater than about a micron. Well, whereas if we want to talk about young stars, we have to look over here and then, and then you know, hope for the best with the extinction. Um, then you can get, of course, these, these dust bumps. And <coughs> um, so anybody can tell me what these features are? Students only. pH is right. Okay, so these are the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon features, right? No one quite knows where they come from, but there they are. Uh, so we have to you know, think about them. And in fact, they're quite bright. Uh, so this, uh, this, this is important. Uh, they can be destroyed also by very hard ionizing photons. So then this is the thermal dust peak, of course, and in the, in the case of this starburst galaxy, it peaks at around 80 microns, typically more in the Milky Way, it's more like 100 microns, something like that. That's basically just a superposition of black bodies from the various dust components in the galaxy. Uh, and then way out here, uh, you, you sort of, have this down here, and what does the synchrotron come from? Anyone? In a, in a star forming galaxy? No? Synchrotron comes from basically shocks uh, from the supernovae. So you have supernovae that go off, right? And the, the sh it hits the interstellar uh, medium, and that creates, um, that creates essentially uh, synchrotron radiation. So this is, of course, very unimportant in this galaxy, but it can be very important for, for other situations. So that's basically the SED, and the point is that this SED varies with galaxy type, right? So this is the observational information that we can get, you know, for as, at least uh, that, we, that we have access to, both in terms of the broadbands here, as well as, you know, in, in some cases, emission lines. And the point is, like, something like an elliptical, like, like NGC 5018, uh, is not going to have a lot of thermal emission from, because there isn't a lot of dust. Uh, present day disks also don't have that much thermal emission, because actually the, the star forming regions don't tend to be all that obscured, unlike at starburst or uh, at high redshift galaxies, tend to look more like this, right, where basically you get star formation a lot more embedded in the, in the extincted regions, so you end up uh, with, a, with a much stronger dust peak, and of course that goes up into the Eulerg regime, which are the brightest infrared galaxies. So this is the information we have from starlight, okay? And what we have to think about now, again, in our, when, we, when we're doing our modeling, is you know, which of our galaxy, formation, galaxy components are going to give rise to, to which of these peaks, and are we getting it right? And, and 
you know, are we getting the physics of each of these components correct? So that's the stars, but ga galaxies are made up of other things as well, right? They're made up of gas, right? So <coughs> for gas, um, the star-forming gas is typically, um, if, you, if you have, um, uh, you need molecular gas to form stars, at least uh, that's the, the conventional wisdom. So, <coughs> so this molecular gas is, of course, uh, a molecular hydrogen in the most, you know, since, since hydrogen is the most common element, but hydrogen is very difficult to detect, so we try to use tracers. This is where things get very complicated. Right? So we want to be able to measure the amount of molecular gas so we can say how, how efficient is star formation. Right? We see we can measure the star formation occurring in the optical, uh, let's say in the UV continuum or in one of the emission lines, but the question is how, how, how much molecular gas is it coming from? And that, you know, for something like um, the Milky Way, we kind of have a good idea what it is, but that, that, that good idea deteriorates relatively quickly when we start to move away from things uh, that are Milky Way-like. So, for instance, you have CO lines, okay, so carbon monoxide is the most, uh, is the brightest uh, molecular tracer of, of molecular hydrogen, so what people typically do is try to measure CO lines, and of course CO lines are, you know, things like have different rotational quantum numbers, so 2 to 1, 3 to 2, etc. All, of course, delta J1, since you're emitting a photon, it's been one, and so, <coughs> so basically, um, you know, depending on the physical conditions of the galaxy, you can excite these, these rotational uh, modes in the, in the CO molecule to different levels, right? And because of that, you can get different shapes for the, what's called a CO ladder, right? So a priori, if you just measure one CO transition, it's not that straightforward to necessarily go back and get you know, a full gas mass out of that. What we'd like to do is measure the total gas mass in all the CO transitions, put together some sort of a model, you know, a PDR model or something like that, that then tells you, okay, you know, this is the, the total number of CO molecules that are gi giving rise to all that. But it's, you know, it's hard to measure all these things, on top of which there's a lot of other uncertainties. Okay? So not only is the density, the physical conditions an uncertain thing, there's also the metallicity. I mean, obviously, if, if the metallicity were zero, then, then H2 wouldn't trace, uh, you know, uh, CO wouldn't be traced at all, right? Uh, there'd be no CO. So, <coughs> so clearly, at low metallicity, any sort of, you know, proportional relationship between H2 and CO is going to break down. Um, so, but where and how, right? Uh, another issue is that, you know, these, uh, these molecular, um, these molecules tend to get formed on dust grains, and so you have to form dust in order to form the molecules, efficiency, so on and so forth. So that's another complication is the metallicity. And finally, you have the radiation field. So one of the things is that um, CO traces H2, but it's not a perfect tracer, right? It's not that exactly the same physical conditions that give rise to H2 also give rise to CO, right? That's not the case. So there are differences, and those differences do depend on what exactly the density, temperature structure, and the ionization structure of that gas is. And so you have to uh, know something about the, your local interstellar radiation field in the regions where the CO is coming from, uh, and this can be very difficult. This can be really tricky because, uh, you know, essentially that's, that's propagation of photons through this clumpy, very, you know, uh, uh, complicated interstellar medium. So all of these things basically, you know, argue for uh, really trying to, being able to understand the interstellar medium at a very, very high level, right, in order to be able to interpret these sort of uh, 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 diagnostics in a proper way. There are other things besides CO, right? So uh, these are less bright, and so they're harder to see particularly far away, but now with ALMA, you know, this is starting to become accessible, so here are some of the, the other transitions that people t popularly see, things like HCO+, HCN, <coughs> and uh, so on and so forth. The thing to remember about these is that each of these has a particular critical density associated with it. So for instance, uh, if you're looking at you know, HCN 2 to 1, you're, and you see a bunch of it, right? you're looking at gas that's very dense, that has density of you know, a million uh, atoms per cubic centimeter right? in, in, in typical uh, conditions. So this is for a, a particular uh, metallicity, et cetera. So, <clears throat> so that's, you know, whereas something like, you know, CO tends to be, uh, live a little bit down here, particularly CO1 to 0 tends to live down here. 
So this is part of the reason why these lines are, are fainter is because there's just less gas living at those very high densities, right? So in principle, the idea is if we can get it, measurements of all these various lines, C, various CO ladder lines, various of these lines, we can really map out the, the, uh, the PDF, uh, the density distribution within the interstellar medium. And that's, I think, a, a very powerful way to not only understand how stars form and things, but also to, to you know, help us with our galaxy formation models to understand uh, you know, how the interstellar medium works. Okay, so that's, that's the molecular gas. Uh, there, that's, of course, not the only kind of gas, right? You have other types of gas. You have the ionized gas as well. Uh, so you can trace that in, for instance, Balmer lines like H-alpha. Uh, this is, of course, coming from OB radiation that is, that is ionizing their nebula. So, so that's, uh, these are nebular emission lines. And those, of course, as you might guess, might trace where the star formation actually is. So that's, those two maps are fairly similar. Uh, you can measure the amount of ionized gas pretty straightforwardly. So unlike this, you don't have too, too many issues. You do have to worry a little bit about extinction, but you can uh, typically correct for that. The other aspect, that the, the other phase of gas that's, that's kind of not accounted for here is the, the neutral gas. And there is a lot of neutral gas in these galaxies, particularly as you get to low mass galaxies, the, the vast majority of the gas is actually neutral. Um, now here, actually, the, the, the challenge is more technological than observational, right? In the sense of the 21 centimeter line, of course, is the hyperfine structure, um, hyperfine transition of the, of the, um, of the uh, hydrogen atom, is, you know, is, is very optically thin. It's very simple to interpret. So it really is just basically proportional to the number of H1 atoms. So that's easy. That's the easy part. The hard part is that it's really faint. Right? It's a forbidden transition, um, and so it it's gets really hard to observe it, uh, you know, just technically challenging to observe it out to large distances, particularly at high resolution, because 21 centimeter is a very long wavelength, of course, and that means your lambda over d is fairly large. And so uh, if you want to be able to do things like resolved maps, that becomes much more challenging in something like H in, in something like 21 centimeter. Nonetheless, I think this is uh, a really exciting frontier, particularly because of all the new telescopes that are coming online, uh, the SKA and its precursors, as well as you know perhaps something some kind of uh, successor to the VLA. So, <clears throat> um, so I think this is this is going to really open up a new window, and particularly um, I think there's there's. You know, what's, what's particularly interesting about H1 to me is if you look at H1 and, and start to go out, right? So you can, you can start to probe out in, let's say, optical or ultraviolet, and quickly you run out of optical light, okay? There are just no stars out there once you get too far out of galaxy. Interestingly, in, in UV, sometimes, I don't know how, how much you can see it, but you can see a little bit of star formation occurring in the outskirts. There are these particular examples, these ex, you know, XUV disks, extreme UV disks, so on and so forth. So there is some star formation out there, presumably star formation, uh, but it's still very hard to trace. Here's an H1 map, right? And you see this H1 just continues all the way out to, you know, you can get H1 sizes of galaxies, extensive galaxies, easy to, to 80, 100 kiloparsecs, okay, if you look deep enough. So that's pretty remarkable, I think, because now we're sort of, we're no longer talking about gas that's in the galaxy, right? We're talking about gas that's really in the circumgalactic medium. It just happens to be neutral, and typically, at least the kinematics of the few that have been examined, tend to show that they, they tend to be sort of rotating in the same direction as the galaxy. So it's clearly a, a signature, well, not clearly, but potentially a signature of accretion. And one of the things that we'd really like to know, of course, about galaxy probation is how galaxies get their gas. This might be one of our most direct probes that we have of that, of being able to image that process and understand how this, this, uh, this reservoir comes about and where it came from, right? So, so that's, I think, what makes, um, what makes H1 particularly interesting. Um, then there's dust, okay? Uh, we, we talked about this a little bit. I'm just going to show this uh, a slightly different slide here. This comes from a particular model. But just to show where all the various uh, transitions are that people typically look at, here's the CO transitions out here in the millimeter regime. And then you have some uh, transitions in sort of the, the submillimeter or far infrared regime, really. And, and yeah, and the various instruments that can, that can uh, trace that sort of thing. If you look at the morphology of the dust, right, that's, that's another interesting thing. So here's a map uh, 
of M33 in CO2 to 1 versus, uh, versus the dust emission. And what you see is that you know, there is some correlation there, but it's very fuzzy, right? The dust is clearly spread out more. Um, and one of the things this tells you is that the dust is essentially uh, you know, a, a, a something that's tracing star formation, that has to kind of trace star formation over a longer time scale than something like uh, CO or, uh, or something like uh, some, of the, uh, some of the other, uh, like H alpha or something like this. So, um, <clears throat> so I think it's, you know, it's interesting to sort of look at these maps and, and try to understand where these, where these features come from. So, okay. Finally, galaxies have black holes, right? And so we have to also figure out where the black holes come from and what they're doing, right? Um, the first thing, step one in that, is to figure out which galaxies have actual active black holes that might be doing something. Um, and that's already a very difficult problem. Um, and there's a number of different ways that, that people try to go about doing that. Um, so <clears throat> the, um, one of the ways is using these sort of optical line diagnostics, the so-called BPT diagram. And essentially the idea, again, the physics idea here, is that as you move up in this direction, you're going to harder ionizing radiation. Okay, that's, that's essentially, you know, these sort of line ratios measure the hardness of the ionizing radiation that the gas is seeing. And so if much of the emission is coming from very hard uh, radiation, you expect that there's some sort of an AGN in there, right? And so that's why essentially this blue stuff, these are Seifert galaxies, so AGN, um, and then there's you know, different ways to div divide the star-forming population from the AGN population in such a diagram. Uh, you know, this is sort of more of an empirical thing to really only select star-forming galaxies, whereas this is a more theoretical one from Lisa Culey uh, that, that basically uh, tries to be more conservative on the AGN side. <coughs> and, um, and then there are these liner things, which are, are a big mess, very, very confusing. So these are typically things that occur in massive elliptical galaxies uh, that, that essentially are, are you know, uh, not forming a whole lot of stars, but stellar evolution processes themselves at late times can give rise to some hard ionizing radiation, and this can excite the gas up into this regime as well. So, <coughs> uh, so essentially, this is, you know, this is one way. So you, know, you have the optic, when people say optical AGN identification, what they're typically talking about is some sort of a, a, a line diagnostic, and there are various variants on this one. Um, sort of the more traditional way of trying to identify AGN is either in the X-ray or the radio. And again, if you look at an SED, you know, and look at something like a radio galaxy, this is a, a you know, redshift, I think, around two radio galaxy. Um, you see that, okay, you have your, your optical stuff and your, uh, your infrared stuff, but then you have, compared to, if you remember, the, the, the previous synchrotron emission was quite low for the star-forming galaxy, here we start to get, uh, get uh, some quite, a, quite strong synchrotron emission, and what that's actually coming from is not the galaxy itself, but oftentimes these radio lobes, okay? So you see these, these galaxies blowing out these big radio lobes, and that then uh, creates uh, the, the, the shocks which lead to the synchrotron uh, radiation which accelerate the particles. Um, or you have x-rays, right? So that's another thing, you know, black holes are very obviously, uh, you know, very energetic objects, and so they can, in their accretion disk, they can create uh, very energetic uh, uh, photons. So, you know, the problem is, of course, that the X-rays can be absorbed. The radios are the radio emission is quite good, but it's not really coming from the accretion disk itself. The optical emission is good, but it's you know it can be very confused. There's a big region where there's some AGN contribution, but a lot, some of it is star formation. Um, you know, another thing to point out is that you know, as you get radio fluxes at 1.4 gigahertz above about 100. Uh, Microjanskis, you're basically uh, going into the regime of AGN. Below that, you get enough synchrotron uh, that 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 typically you're actually picking up star-forming galaxies. Okay, um, and so <coughs> that's that's kind of a that's that's a regime that hasn't been probed yet, but will be probed quite a lot with future radio telescopes. And so I think this is this is kind of an interesting frontier. Even from that point of view, besides the H1 in the radio, you also have the radio continuum from star formation and galaxies at, 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 um, at, 
at low fluxes, low radio fluxes, and that can actually provide a, another sort of dust-free measure of, of, the, of the star formation rate. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. No, no, you don't, yeah. So, yeah, so only about 10%, people argue about that number, of the AGN are, are radio loud. Uh, so there, there's actually a, a fairly small minority of them. Um, so the jets don't always look this prominent. Um, so they're different, you know, they, you know, for the last, like, 30 years before they ever talked to galaxy formation people, the AGN people were just busy creating this incredible taxonomy, like, you know, some, like, Carolus Linnaeus or something, of, of all these various AGN things that, uh, you know, different types and type ones and type twos and type one whatevers. So, um, you know, then there was this attempt at this unification model. I don't want to talk about it because it's like a whole nother can of worms and I'm, I'm not sure it's totally right even, uh, but, you know, uh, yeah, it's it it, it, it rapidly um, there there are many variations, and I think one of the things we do have to understand as as galaxy formation modelers is what triggers this sort of AGN activity, right? What what creates suddenly a radio loud AGN? Um, not all the time. Yeah. Uh, how do you think each of the AGN emitted ones are different from? So well, the H1 is a is a is a line emission, right? So essentially, it will it will be be an actual uh, line feature, of course. So that that feature. So in a typical radio telescope, you get a data cube, right? And it's basically frequency to spatial dimensions, and that contains all the information. It contains continuum, contains the line, and so on and so forth. So then you have to go through and look for the lines, right? Uh, the H1 is the, another big benefit of H1 is as soon as you see H1, you know exactly the redshift, right? Uh, so that's that's really good. Uh, the, so H1 is is fantastic in a lot of ways. If it weren't so doggone faint, right? If we could just build a, you know, take over half the moon and just carve it out and make a telescope, we'd be we'd be golden. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As far as I'm aware, that's that's generally true. I don't know of too many. I can't think of any examples of radio quiet AGN that actually have jets. They may have relic sort of features out there, but active jets, no. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, any black hole accretion disk people here? That uh, that I don't know. Um, so there's a handful of systems that people talk about with jets that show all kinds of structure you know, like spiral out yes. that are interpreted as that as a product of that. Okay. Point of view. Uh, from a theoretical point of view, the as long as you have an inner disk, you should be able to get jets because they're binary interacting fronts separated. Ah, right. So, that's an interesting question, why we see so few quadruple jets. That's a good clue. So, well, because if you look at the evolution of galaxies merge, when a merger takes place, you tend to have systems with two jets or ten jets or whatever. Quadruple jets are rare. Yeah. Right, so the question is, do both of them accrete? Right, so if 10% has a jet, well, we have a lot of mergers, but most galaxies go through mergers, and quadruple jets are extinctive. So if you go through yeah. quadruple jets, the a section for merger, then uh, two single black holes, because the binary radius will be the uh, cross-section for merger, so they won't stick around very long. Well, no, I think he's talking about when, when during the merger process. When right? there is gas, there has to be gas That's around I think the key. all four black holes, and they, yet they have to be far enough right. away from the center that they haven't merged. Right. So, so the idea is, you know, because, so I think David's point is that, you know, the, the, the mergers of galaxies are very gaseous processes. 
and therefore the gas can be very quickly funneled in to the middle and all gets smushed up and viscously, you know, whatever, turn into a, you know, blob. Yes, smushed up. Um, viscously smushed up, though. That's, um, but the black holes, right, are, are these giant bowling balls, right? And so they had, should take a much longer time to merge in principle, right? And that's, and so the, I think the, my understanding of the explanation of that is that basically one of the objects, uh, the tidal forces are such that they strip off the gas sufficiently that those, that second black hole is just never very active uh, at a sufficient rate. But I don't know if that's true or not. It's just. The number of particles is very small. It's very small, right? I mean, we can see that. Uh, so empirically, that seems to be true. The, 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 the only question is whether that is the correct explanation. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. Okay, any other questions on the observational sort of part? I was going to move on now. Um, okay, so, right. So, our job as modelers, you know, explain that. You know, can your God do this, right? This sort of thing. Um, so, <coughs> So what is basically, you know, I'm, I'm just going to sort of put it out there because I think there's been a lot of work that's gone into understanding galaxy evolution over the last certainly 30 years. And um, I think one of the big, the, one of the big impacts that simulations and particularly gas dynamical simulations have had is an understanding of how galaxies join up to the sur surrounding circumgalactic medium out into the intergalactic medium as well and understanding this whole galaxy formation process as sort of an ecosystem rather than kind of this model of, okay, now I have a halo and I'm gonna form a little galaxy in it and I'm not gonna care about anything else until something smashes into me, right? Um, <clears throat> so I think the, the paradigm that's kind of developed is um, one where, uh, you know, the first thing you have to do to form a galaxy is of course get gas into it. And in order to get gas into it, Luckily, galaxies live in overdense, at overdense knots, and you have gravity, and so you can pull this stuff in. And I think it's been shown in many simulations, uh, certainly Avishai Dekel, Dushan Karish have been some of the pioneers in this, uh, in showing that the typical mode for these sorts of uh, accretion is, is quite filamentary, right? And the reason is that <coughs> in order to get down into here, the gas has to cool, radiate away its potential energy, and in order to do that, of course, cooling being an n-squared process means that if you have an overdense region, uh, you know, you're going to enhance the cooling in that region, and it's a runaway process, right? And so you can form these filamentary structures, uh, even though the, if you look at the dark matter filaments associated with it, they're not nearly as tight. You know, they kind of look a lot fuzzier, right? But because of, because of the way the radiative cooling interplays with that, you end up with these very uh, tight uh, amounts of gas coming in on these very uh, in these filamentary structures. So this is a very generic process. It allows you to penetrate through this virial radius, sort of like it isn't even there. Okay. So one of the you know things, pet peeve statements I always make or whatever soapbox statements I always make is that the virial radius is a completely meaningless quantity for star forming galaxies and uh, mostly meaningless for massive galaxies as well. But, but for star-forming galaxies, really nothing happens interesting at the virial radius. Um, so gas passes right through it. Um, there's no shock there. Uh, you know, essentially what, what's going on is that the cooling rate at, the, at, these, uh, at any given point is such that it is, it is faster than the compressional or shock heating rate for the gas being having to be funneled in. Okay, so that's, that's essentially the condition and you can work it out analytically uh, for, for when, that, when that tends to be true. When you work it out analytically for when it tends to be true, remarkably the number you get is it's true in halo masses below right around 10 to the 12 solar masses. And that's a nice convenient number which seems to you know, jive with a lot of other things. Okay, so that's one thing. So we can get gas sort of into the ISM mostly, but then we have to make it into stars and that turns out to be very inefficient. And that's not entirely obvious why, right? Uh, of course, this is a whole other field, star formation. Um, but, uh, you know, you can illustrate it in this, you know, sort of cosmic star formation efficiency plot, if you like to call it that, or, or conversion efficiency plot, where you have your stellar mass, the fraction of the baryons 
in a halo of a given mass that have been converted into stars. So you know, if, if essentially all the baryons were converted into stars, uh, they, would, they would all light up here. And that's what you would expect, generically, if you just took a halo, said, OK, I'm going to have a big ball of baryons, and I'm just going to let it go, OK, since redshift 20, or whatever it is what you want. Uh, you will get values up here, all right? Uh, so <coughs> believe me, that, those are the first simulations I did. I was like, my galaxies don't look anything like real guys. Yeah, that's, uh, so that's, um, that's very wrong, right? Uh, this, these points are just from Ben Moster's little um, semi-empirical model. Uh, but the point is, like, there, there's, even at the peak efficiency, it's sort of maybe 20%. So only 20% of the stars have been converted into gas. And then to either side, it's quite a bit lower. So that tells you that there's feedback going on. Right, that there's that galaxies are self-regulating, that they don't uh, they don't just you know take what they have and use it up, uh, they somehow retard their own process or something retards it, uh, and at low masses, the, and the fact that this is sort of a two this has two different strongly different dependencies argues for two different mechanisms, and no one has really been able to figure out a single mechanism that can do both of these things right at once. So the, the current paradigm is that basically below L star, 10 to the 12 solar mass halo-ish, uh, you're mostly dominated by galactic outflows from the, from the star-forming galaxies powered by young stars, supernovae, et cetera, and that's what regulates the mass and metal growth. And <coughs> the other sort of interesting aspect that I think has become quite a bit um, prominent in, in recent discussions is the idea of wind recycling and the idea that stuff that comes out of galaxies doesn't stay out, can come back in, and, it, and at least in some simulations, like ones we did a few years ago, uh, that is actually the dominant accretion path for, for, uh, for gas into galaxies at late times, for something like the Milky Way. So it's not stuff that's coming in just fresh from the IGM at all. Um, then, of course, you have the massive galaxy end, right? And that's, uh, that's you know, these black holes either growing along with the galaxies. Uh, I'll show you some data on that in a minute. And then AGN feedback is sort of responsible for this. And why do we think it's AGN feedback? Well, it's basically you know, the old Sherlock Holmes thing when you've eliminated all the uh, you know, things that are uh, improbable and, and whatever's left is, or impossible, then whatever's left is right. And so there's no other energy source, really, in these galaxies. I mean, the type 1a supernovae are pretty meager. Uh, so the, the only place you can get energy to, to, to do something to suppress star formation here is, is from this. And luckily, there's a lot of energy in that black hole if you can just get it out of it. So, so I think that's, that's kind of the, the basic scenario. And uh, just for terminology, generally, this part of the equation you know, that's operating below here is referred to as the baryon cycle, these inflows and outflows and recycling. And then this part is referred to as quenching. Okay? So that's, that's the, when we talk about baryon cycle and quenching, that's kind of what we're referring to. So, you know, no simulation talk would be, well, no modeling talk would be complete without a movie. So here's a fire simulation just to give you an illustration of what this looked like. This turns out to be a disk somewhat smaller, a little bit smaller than the Milky Way. Uh, so this set of simulations, you probably know about fire, includes, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, stellar feedback, uh, both supernovae, stellar winds. You know, obviously some assumptions are made in this. It's not quite as parameter-free as <laughs> maybe some of them claim, but you know, uh, it <laughs> uh, but you know, it, it is an interesting model because it does really produce galaxies a lot like we see. So early on, below redshift or above redshift, sort of two, you saw it was a very chaotic system, right? There's lots of merging going on, and then there's sort of a transition period, and then after redshift one, things really quiet down a lot, right? Um, so. You know, you get maybe a little bit of breathing from the supernovae, but there's not any huge, big, big events anymore like they were like they were at early times. Ooh, that's a nice little uh, fun thing, right? So, uh, you know, and then you settle down into a nice disk, and and this goes for a while. And <coughs> the point of this, right, is to say that you know what what are the various things that are that are that are giving rise to all this? Now you start to grow a disk, right? A nice thin disk, if you can look at it, edge on. <coughs> and you know, there's there's basically several things going on. One is, of course, the the star formation rates are higher at earlier times. You know this from the Medal plot, right? So the the cosmic star formation rate and the star formation rate of individual galaxies is higher, um, and this causes more energetic feedback at early times. There's also more merging going on at early times because the universe is smaller and there's just more stuff around to merge with. Okay, so the universe, uh, so there's more merging. And 
uh, the gas accretion rate is also lower, okay? And we'll talk about that in just a minute, but that's basically, uh, you know, all of these things sort of conspire to give rise to a very different behavior when you look at a galaxy at redshift two, even if the same mass, than, than one at redshift zero. Okay, so that's very complicated, and that took like millions of CPU hours and all this sort of craziness, right? Um, can you do uh, any sort of interesting modeling in a fraction of a CPU hour, right, that you can do in your brain? Uh, so let's, let's talk about um, essentially modeling galaxies in a very, very simplistic way and see how far we can get. But I think that, I think that the, the, this is very illustrative because it sort of encapsulates a lot of the ideas and, and sets a good way to think about how galaxy formation works. So the way I like to think about galaxies is that galaxies are gas processing factories, okay? So you have your little uh, factory here, right? So this is a factory, right? Okay, so what are you gonna do with a factory? Well, a factory needs raw materials, right? You're gonna make something out of this, right? So the raw materials are coming in from the intergalactic medium. And the good news is, thanks to CDM and Lambda CDM or whatever, we know what this is to reasonable accuracy, not great actually, but, but reasonable accuracy, at least out at something like the virial radius. So we know how much material is falling in, uh, baryonic material. The problem is, of course, you know, it's a supply chain, there's always, you know, somebody who has to take a bribe and something falls off the truck or whatever, and you only get some fraction of that actually coming into the galaxy, right? So let's just call that zeta for now. Right, so you have this sort of zeta parameter, and that corresponds to uh, effectively what you can think of as preventive feedback. So, you know, what was prevented from, that was accreted onto the, you know, far away, let's say at the virial radius or whatever far radius you want to pick, uh, versus what actually made it into the reservoir of the galaxy to be eligible for star formation, right? So let's call that zeta. Okay, now you gotta make a, make a product with that. Well, obviously galaxies make stars, right? So you, you, have, you have a bunch of stars that get made. But it's a, you know, with any galaxy, you have some waste product. So you have the waste product that's going to be ejected out of it. And the ratio between the, the rate of formation of stars, and, well, the, the ejection process versus the rate of formation of stars is typically denoted eta. Uh, this is called this mass loading factor. And so uh, that's going to be the ratio there. But of course, we live in the 21st century and <coughs> we need environmentally friendly factories. So we have to recapture some of that waste, right? Uh, so we have this, this term, which basically is what fraction of, or, or on what time scale, if you want to think of it that way, does the material that's, that's ejected eventually come back into the galaxy, right? So in this little very simple scenario, I can essentially write down mass balance. And if I write down mass balance, I can figure out what is this term? What is the rate of formation of the stars, right? And that turns out to be this, which is, again, you just fairly straightforward to see. It's the, the term coming in from this, the term coming in from that, divided by one plus eta, all right? Very simple. Um, turns out you can also do the metallicity. So if you say that there's, uh, if you form some stars, uh, you have to enrich this. This is the unenriched component, right? This component came out of the galaxy, so it's already enriched, so you don't need to worry about the, the enrichment of that. But if you, en if you enrich just this component, um, with some metals that, you know, every time you form star, uh, uh, some stars, you, you enrich with some yield Y, uh, then that's the metallicity as well. Okay, so these are our parameters, right? There's, there's zeta, there's eta, which is ejective feedback, so preventive feedback, ejective feedback, and something to do with wind recycling, however we want to parameterize this. Let's say um, recently people have been talking about this recycling time. So I like to call these baryon cycling parameters because this is essentially what baryon cycling is, is, is doing, right? Okay, so <clears throat> um, that was a little bit glib, right? Because there was an important term that I forgot. Uh, I, I didn't just forget it, I actually in intentionally ignored it, which is this reservoir term. So you can imagine that stuff comes in, it never makes it, it just piles up on the loading dock, right? It never makes it to actually into the factory. Um, the interesting things about, thing about this is, you know, we looked into this back in 2008 and other people have looked into it as well, is that this term evolves, it's not zero, but it evolves much more slowly compared to these other terms, to the point where it's, you know, it's a decent approximation to neglect, okay? So if you neglect that term, then you get these equations. Uh, you can also write down the gas fraction. This is essentially just rewriting the definition of the gas fraction. And then you can get your m dot from gravity, the, from the IGM, just based on CDM and some fitting function. Okay, so you have a bunch of parameters, you know, 
this is an incredibly simple model, right? Does it have any hope of working at all? Well, we try, We thought, oh, well, why not try it, right? Just, uh, what the heck? Um, let's put our three parameters, uh, create a amplitude, a, a mass dependence, and a redshift dependence. So that's three parameters for each. So that's nine total parameters, right? Throw it into a big MCMC and say, oh, let's get a bunch of data and constrain to it. OK, what kind of data can we constrain to? Well, we can constrain to things like the stellar mass halo mass relation. Right? That's kind of a fundamental thing. So is the mass metallicity relation, if we're predicting metallicities, or this thing called the main sequence, the relation between uh, stellar mass and star formation rate. And the answer is it's not bad. Surprisingly good, actually. Um, so for, for, for one that has basically nine parameters, and in fact, we get it down to eight based on some Bayesian evidence stuff, uh, we can basically, you know, to, to a decent chi-squared, reproduce, reproduce uh, these sort of both the evolution uh, and the amplitudes of all these models. Okay, so why is that interesting? We threw in a bunch of parameters, who cares, right? Uh, that, was, that was sort of fun, but did we learn anything from that? Well, we learned some generic things, right? Because what we can do is then say, okay, what sort of baryon cycling parameters did we need in order for us to get a, a model that worked, right? Um, I won't show you the Bayesian posteriors, but they're actually fairly tightly constrained. So it's, it's uh, you know, these things are not terribly free, right? Um, and so they, there's some generic trends that you can, I wouldn't pay attention to the exact numbers here, right? This is too simple a model for that. But you, the generic trends turn out to be uh, something that, that, you know, people who do simulations or semi-analytic models or have kind of arrived to independently anyway, uh, just by trial and error. But here we can sort of see where it comes from, in the, at least in this very simple model. Um, so what are the, some of the generic trends? Well, the first generic trend is that the mass loading factor has to strong, drop, uh, drop strongly with mass, right? Has to increase to low masses. And so as you're getting down to low mass galaxies, uh, you know, uh, particularly at high redshifts, you can get mass loading factors of tens or 100. That's what we seem to need. Whether or not we can actually figure out the physics that gets that, that's a whole separate question, right? Uh, but that's what, th that's what, at least in the context of this silly model, that's what we would seem to need. Um, it's not that silly because these sorts of trends actually agree pretty well with the kind of things that you get out of, you know, if you go measure it in the fire simulations, let's say, okay? Uh, so they're not too dissimilar than this. And they do have that same sort of trend. Um, there's a, a sort of a weak redshift evolution. I think this is more controversial. Um, it's not totally uh, necessary. You can sort of get a, probably get away without it. But <coughs> the other thing is, of course, that we have to uh, have strong preventive feedback at the mass of galaxies. And you can see this sort of feature that we introduce by introducing a quenching mass scale above which we no longer allow galaxies to accrete uh, as part of our preventive feedback. And <coughs> And so that again tells you that that you know just simple star formation. You know one of the things you could think about is saying, well, you know as you get bigger enough halo, big enough halos, you will have uh, sufficiently long cooling times that you know they, the gas just won't cool. Period. Right. And and that's the trend you, you start to see here. You start to see more and more shock heating as you get above 10 to the 12 solar mass in the halo mass because the cooling rate at the viral radius is no longer fast enough like it was before. Right. Um, so you start to see that trend, but this is, th there has to be a break here. There has to be an additional uh, thing, okay? And it's very difficult to, to work things without it. Um, the other thing is to look at the recycling time, right? Just sort of get an order of magnitude ballpark estimate of what this is. This is in giga years, right? So in giga years, basically, has a relatively, some dependence on mass, but, and, and, and redshift, but basically it's up order a giga year or so, right? And it's, and it's smaller, in high mass galaxies. So high mass things tend to, tend to recycle faster. Okay. You might expect this again on physical grounds simply because you know, high mass galaxies are more massive, they're able to hold on to their uh, you know, have larger potential wells. So most current galaxy formation models, you know, again, not using this thing, but basically have arrived at similar scalings or at least qualitatively similar scalings from completely independent uh, considerations, right? Uh, so that's, that's why this model is interesting, is because it actually enca encapsulates these sorts of trends that we need in the baryon cycling parameters in order for, to get galaxy formation models to work, right? And that's, uh, uh, I think that's, that's one of the key lessons that, that we can take away and say that, you know, we now, we now understand this part, what we need to get. The question is, of course, uh, 
what is the physics that gives rise to any of that? And that's, that's a whole separate thing. So <clears throat> interestingly, so far I haven't once talked about merging, right? Um, so in this model, so the, the, there's, there's essentially very little merging going on. Uh, you can think about the scatter associated with the fact that halos aren't, you know, the, ga the dark matter isn't smoothly flowing in, the gas isn't smoothly flowing in, it's coming in in lumps, right? And if you do that, I won't go into all of this, this detail here, but let me just uh, skip over that part, but basically you can get, uh, you, can s you can show that essentially the, the, uh, the, s the inflow fluctuations lead to a scatter around these sort of the scaling relations I was talking about, the stellar mass, halo mass, the uh, mass, metallicity, so on and so forth, right? Uh, and so this is the example of the, the scatter around, this, around the main sequence, the star formation rate stellar mass relation uh, from directly from inflow fluctuations in our particular, in this simple model versus what's, what's actually been observed. And of course, you know, uh, many of these contain observational errors. So they're sort of, uh, ours should be below that. Um, okay, uh, gas fractions. I just wanted to mention sort of gas fractions. What are, what are the gas fractions doing, right? So, okay, we, are, we said that the gas reservoir is slowly evolving. Can we make more quantitative predictions for this, right? Because we can now observe gas out in galaxies to fairly high redshift. And the answer is yes, but we have to invoke one more piece of information. And that is, how fast is the gas getting consumed once it comes into the reservoir? So, you know, what's the production line speed, right? Luckily, that seems to be relatively well uh, constrained, at least locally, that uh, if you look at the, the, uh, the star formation rate of, of, let's say, disk galaxies today, you convert typically maybe a couple percent of your gas mass into stars within a dynamical time. Okay, that's, that's kind of a, a variant of the Kennecott-Schmidt relation. So if your dynamical time in a simple disk model, uh, you know, is like MoMA and White or something like that, scales with the Hubble time, then this is basically the inverse of the Hubble time, which at high redshift would be something like 1 plus c e to the 1.5. So the gas consumption then, that's the rate at which you can consume the gas. Well, how fast is the gas getting supplied? Well, the gas getting supplied from the intergalactic medium, that inflow, if you remember that power, is something like 2 to 2.5, somewhere in that range, right? So this power is higher than this power. If that power is higher than that power, it means you go to sufficiently high redshift, you're gonna be dumping gas onto that galaxy so fast, it's not gonna be able to keep up, right? You can calculate what that redshift is, again, within context of you know, some assumptions, and uh, I won't go into exactly how this is derived, but basically you get values of around you know, something like four to six, depending on exactly the mass and so on and so forth. So once you get into the high redshift regime, you would expect that galaxies can't keep up with, with forming stars, if the big assumption this still holds, right? If it's still converting only 2% of its mass into stars in a dynamical time. If it's faster, then, then of course it can reach equilibrium earlier. Um, okay, so there's this initial gas accumulation phase, but then after that, right, you can get, uh, you, 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 you can just, just compute what the gas fraction is based on the depletion time, which I got this scaling from simulations, but it's, you know, reasonably consistent with data. Uh, and then this is the evolution of the specific star formation rate where beta is just the power of the specific star formation rate versus stellar mass. And you, you end up with, with this type of, um, which typically something like minus 0.2 or something like this. Uh, so you end up with something like that. And this is about what's observed, okay? So essentially, uh, if you look at a Milky Way galaxy today, right, uh, your gas fraction is about 10% at redshift two, you know, the, the power here is about one, so the red bridge of two, it should be about 30%, and that's, that's typically what you see for something of the same size. So, <clears throat> so essentially, this, this, this slowly evolving gas reservoir just reflects this, cause, this competition between the inflow that's dumping stuff onto the loading dock versus how fast you can take it off and form it into stars or eject it into an outflow. Mm -hmm. Is that one plus C is plus to a minus one? No, that's, uh, one? yeah, that's a tilde one. Yeah, more or less one. Uh, so the problem is that this only, 1.5 only holds at high redshift. When you get to lower redshift, this lambda creates, doesn't create, make that, that makes it closer to one plus z. Um, and then, you know, this is an uncertain number. Okay, so, yeah, so then, okay, so that's basically, you know, this sort of simple galaxy formation model. 
And then we're trying to understand some of the physics associated with that, right? So one of the physics that's, that's associated with that is the fact that we have to quench these massive galaxies. And we have to figure out what it is that's actually doing that quenching. Again, you know, by, by simple reductio ad absurdum arguments, we say it's the black hole. Okay, so what are the black holes doing? Well, the black holes are doing, um, are, are, as you know, of course, you know, correlated with the galaxies fairly, a, not super strongly, but at least reasonably strongly. Um, it appears that the black hole mass to stellar mass ratio for, again, for bulge-dominated systems uh, is not evolving very quickly. Maybe it's evolving in higher redshifts, but there's a lot of selection effect issues, so it's not totally clear. Uh, so there's, there's, there's something that is basically co-growing the black holes roughly with the galaxies or averaged over a sufficiently long time scale. Okay? Maybe that's not surprising. You know, Bigger things are bigger, so if, you know, if things are growing their stars, they should all grow their, also grow their gas. Um, that's true. That could be the case. But there's also a lot of evidence that the black holes are impacting the galaxies themselves. So for instance, uh, we, we can see black hole feedback, right? So we talked about jets already, but there's a, there's a lot of work going on recently about these molecular outflows. So in a molecular outflow, what they're looking at is, again, these CO lines or something like that. They look at a line profile of something like this, this uh, uh, starburst, uh, AGN starburst marker, Mercarian 231, and you see that it's not Gaussian down here, right? One would expect if all the molecular gas were just rotating in the disk, you would see a Gaussian profile, but you don't. You see an additional term which extends out to quite large velocities, much higher than the, the circular velocity of the galaxy itself. Um, and this has been interpreted, this is commonly interpreted these days now as, as molecular outflows. So these are outflows that are being generated by the starburst, either the AGN or the, the star formation. Um, they're extended. They actually, if you add up the kinetic energy, because you can measure the mass in this term, now that you sort of know it and make some assumptions, of course, about how to convert CO to, to H2, which is very uncertain, but, you know, if, you, if it's a few hundred solar masses per year, you're talking about kinetic powers that are you know, a few percent of the AGN, a few percent of m dot c squared. So it's very large, with large momentum rates. Okay? Uh, so it's mass loading a lot of stuff as it's going out. So this, you, know, you can say, okay, this little black hole here is dumping a huge amount of energy out here, and that's going to you know, slow the cooling, so on and so forth. Um, but this is a way to actually just get rid of the gas altogether. I mean, you don't have to do this for very long, you know, 10 to the 10 million years, and you got rid of 10 to the 10 solar mass of the gas, right? So that's a, uh, so that's you know, uh, that's potentially another feedback way uh, of doing things. Okay, um, I think, eh, you know, I think I'll I'll go through this very quickly, but I think it's you know sort of the the overall picture I think that has that has been coming together from uh, various things as of maybe five or, you know, five-ish or ten years ago, is that, you know, you start off with a disk, you merge them together, you form a ULERG, then you have sort of a blowout phase, uh, which results in a, 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 a sort of a naked quasar, and then you decay into a, a post-starburst galaxy, which eventually ends up into a red and dead elliptical. So this is one scenario for how to quench galaxies. Right? This is sort of a, a, what you might call a rapid quenching mode associated with this blowout phase, which we might be catching as these molecular outflows. Right? Is this the way all galaxies quench? Right? Do all, galaxies, all massive ellipticals go through this phase? And I think the answer is almost certainly no, certainly today. Right? And the reason is very simple, actually, uh, when you start to think in a cosmological context. So the problem is the early simulations were done sort of isolated things, and the great thing about an isolated simulation, you smash two things together, nothing else happens to it. It's totally isolated, no further infall or anything like that. It just sits there, right? Uh, so you, can, you, know, you, you might get the wrong idea about what's going on compared to having continual cosmological infall. And so um, you know, many semi-analytic models looked into this. We sort of simply confirmed it, basically, with, with hydro simulations that if... Um, that, that uh, you know, I think Darren Croton's was, a, was, a, was the first one to sort of, you know, talk about this and, and uh, coin the frame radio mode at least, that if you just have this hot halo that forms for some reason at the virial temperature and you allow 
that hot halo to just stay hot, somehow prevent cooling in anything, you can really get most of the pr properties of red sequence galaxies just fine, right? Without ever having to invoke any kind of a blowout or merger associated thing. Um, and so that's, that's what we confirmed. I won't go into all the details of it, but basically the, the, the punchline uh, from our simulations was that you know, hot gas and massive halos drives both mass and environment quenching. So what are those two quenchings we're talking about here? Well, if you plot the overdensity versus the stellar mass and populate this plot with, from a galaxy survey for what fraction of galaxies are red defined in some way, right? What you find is that things that are either very dense at any mass or very massive at any density are always red, okay? So these things tend to be satellite galaxies. These things, of course, are very massive central galaxies. Both of them seem to get quenched in this, in this sort of, um, uh, um. and so I think one of the, one of the things, one of the, the questions was, well, is the satellite quenching due to satellite-specific processes like you know, tidal stripping or ramp pressure stripping, et cetera, whereas this is something completely different? Um, it turns out, at least in, in some hydro simulations, you can ba basically get it all from the idea that, essentially, the radio mode feedback idea that if you just keep it, the, the hot gas hot, you will, uh, you will produce a red population, as you see. So that, I, you know, so that, that's sort of the counterpoint of it. There are counterpoints at the other direction. For instance, post-starburst galaxies seem to have a very short star formation uh, quenching time scale. You can actually track the, the, the star formation history over the last several hundred years, and it seems to have like, truncated very quickly. Y maybe you can't do that in this sort of simple, slow quenching mode. So what fraction is in this mode versus what fraction is in sort of the fast quenching mode, I think is, is a pretty interesting question that's still sort of open. Um, Okay, any, any sort of questions on that? All right. So I wanted to just spend the last couple of minutes um, talking about the CGM. All right, I think this is, uh, I think, super exciting stuff. So here's the basic idea. The problem is that we think that all this baryon cycle stuff is what's really governing galaxies and blah, blah, blah. Uh, great, so let's go out and observe it, right? Okay, great. What, let's observe some inflows and observe some outflows, right? Ugh, really hard. So we can do maybe these molecular outflows in these very bright few rare cases. Uh, we can try to see, you know, use, use um, you know, the, 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 the spectra of, of um, emission lines coming out, or sorry, absorption lines coming out of galaxies to probe some stuff. But it's very difficult. Um, and... The idea is, you know, the CGM is something like this, right? So you have this accreting gas that's kind of joining onto the disk. You have these outflows that are going out. Some of it is recycling. You have some component of diffuse gas out there that's sitting there. It may, it may be hot or not. Um, this one doesn't even show satellite galaxies, but there are probably a few satellite galaxies out there, so on and so forth. So the idea is that if we can... Uh, the problem is, of course, that all this gas is very diffuse, it's, it's dynamic, it's not necessarily in equilibrium, might be moving around, uh, might be out of thermal equilibrium even. Um, so how do we probe all this? Well, you know, if we had a, a, a sampling of sh flashlights that we could shine through this gas and create absorption lines, maybe we could learn something, right? And so this is basically the kind of thing that people have really tried to, to do. Turns out a lot of the interesting absorption lines that one looks at tend to be in the ultraviolet. So these numbers are in angstroms of their, um, of their uh, uh, transition um, wavelength. And <coughs> so at low redshift, one has to go to space. At, at high redshift, one can do this from the ground. Um, but in either case, I think you know, this, is, this is, I think, a, a really exciting way to try, to try to probe stuff. And just to kind of illustrate some of the ways in which this can uh, govern galaxy formation, um, you know, uh, really, you can, you can sort of ask a lot of questions of the CGM, even from the very highest redshifts, right? So this is something that, that um, uh, Christian Finlater has been working on. With, uh, with some radiative transfer sim galaxy formation simulations to explore very high redshifts, so <coughs> epoch of ionization type things, where now, thanks to infrared spectra gas, those, those UV, emission UV absorption lines are now redshifted into the infrared, but 
you can actually get absorption line measures of things like carbon-2 and carbon-4, also silicon-4. And <coughs> what you can try to do is try to then say that, okay, you know, uh, you have these sort of background quasars, they're probing through these galaxies, they're seeing these absorption lines. What does that tell us? Like, what is the meaning of that, right? And this is where simulations can be very powerful because in principle, if you're doing everything correctly, which of course we know we aren't, but you know, hey, uh, do our best, we can, you know, we can, we, can, we can answer that question directly from the simulations, right? And so, <coughs> um, so this is the kind of thing we do is, you know, we can, we can shoot absorption lines through these simulations and uh, try to compare to the data and try to ask the question, what are these, what are these uh, stars doing? So, you know, I, again, uh, one, of the, one of the important things about early star formation is that it puts metals into the CGM. And those metals then impact the subsequent generation of stars because they're no longer metal free and they have a different IMF, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, you know, how do we go about measuring that IMF? This, you know, the CGM might actually be one way to do that. Uh, looking at line ratios of some of these uh, uh, things once the data gets better. Um, again, the, 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 the photoionization from the CGM is suppressing growth in these photosensitive halos. So again, you have, uh, you have uh, UV light coming out of these first galaxies, and that can actually impact the surrounding galaxies. And this may be, for instance, where Milky Way dwarf elliptical will come from, right? So, uh, so then again, connects to sort of near-field cosmology type stuff. Uh, and then, you know, also 21 centimeter emission. So as the galaxies grow, right, you now uh, enter a regime sort of, you know, getting, getting close to cosmic noon, as they call it, where you see outflows all the time. So at redshift two, you know, Chuck Seidel has made a living out of this, of basically uh, finding, you know, galaxies, getting, getting spectra, and showing that they have very blue shifted absorption lines out to you know, 800,000 kilometers per second at, you know, at most. And these things are obviously outflows, and <clears throat> from these outflows, uh, w essentially one can deduce that basically every star-forming galaxy at this epoch is putting out pretty massive outflows, okay? The interesting thing comes when you want to say, okay, well, that's taking galaxy and going right down the line of sight, but can we take a galaxy and figure out what's going on in the CGM of that galaxy? Well, that's pretty hard because there aren't that many background quasars. They don't happen to be in the right place. But you can use other galaxies, Right, if the other galaxies are bright enough. At the moment, they're not really bright enough with even 10 meter telescopes, so he has to stack. So this is what Chuck did in a very famous 2010 paper, is he took galaxy absorption in galaxy spectra um, and correlated with the foreground galaxy and ba basically was able to measure, for instance, the equivalent width profile of these various ions. So again, this is directly probing some combination of metallicity, ionization conditions and density. You know, those are the three things which set how much carbon is in carbon two versus carbon four or whatever uh, as a function of radius out to these, these galaxies, out to these, these sort of virial radii type things. Um, I think that's, that's something this is, you know, people ask me, you know, what do you think is gonna be the biggest thing from 30 meter class telescopes, right? What's gonna be the most exciting science from 30 meter class telescopes? I think it's gonna be this. We're not, we're not gonna have to do this with stacking anymore. Okay, when we have factor of 10 more area, we just do this on a galaxy by galaxy basis, right? Uh, and that is gonna be incredibly powerful, I think. So that's sort of uh, one uh, area that, that I think is, is quite exciting. The other thing that's happening in this epic is of course the first AGN and the first quench galaxies are appearing. And here's a real argument for, you know, why this fast quenching mode might come about. Because we see uh, red galaxies uh, at already at redshift two and a half, three, okay? So, you know, is there enough time for something like, you know, a slow, quiet, quiet you know, uh, slow quenching to, to actually work? And I, I suspect not, right? So it may be that the, the nature of quenching is quite different at those epochs than it is today. Um, <coughs> we already talked about cold filaments. Uh, yeah, we talked a little bit about settling and trying to understand you know, how the, the inflow from the CGM is actually uh, changing as a function of time. And then we get to the present day, and I think one thing I haven't talked about much, but I think is particularly interesting, are these X-ray halos. So <coughs> um, that's, of course, another form of CGM that's been studied for quite some time, which is uh, X-rays, diffuse X-rays in things like galaxy groups. So this is a galaxy group, uh, and the, the purple is, is the Chandra X-ray emission. And 
uh, you know, not a lot is happening here, but as you get really deep data, you start to see, I mean, even in this relatively modest sized group, you see these sort of bubbles out here, you see the structure, so on and so forth, right? So clearly things have been happening in this intra-group medium, right? And now one thing is it could be, you know, infalling satellites or infalling groups or something, but the other thing is it could be coming out of here. And when you see stuff like this, it sure looks like it might be some double lobe thing that's, that's coming out of the galaxy, right? So is that the, the smoking gun, right, for this sort of AGN feedback that we need to, to quench galaxies? And can we understand the X-ray properties? We know that, you know, shock heating creates these X-rays, but if all this energy is being dumped into these galaxies from the black hole as well due to these jets, surely there's some signature there, right, in something. And can we create a model that self-consistently produces not only the overall X-ray properties just from the shock heating, but also from the, from these, uh, uh, the additional contribution from the jets in a particular way. So <clears throat> I think, okay, so I'm, I'm pretty much out of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop, but um, hopefully this is kind of a, you know, a little bit of a core dump, uh, so uh, sorry about that, but, but it's kind of, I think, hopefully getting you excited about all the different things that are going on and how they all connect to each other. And I think that's the real thing to sort of try to take away from, a, particularly from a place like this, where you're going to be for, you know, interacting with lots of people doing a lot of different things, uh, that, you know, maybe there are connections there that you haven't thought about, and it's, it's worth thinking about. Uh, because I think that's where some of the really interesting progress comes from, is when, you know, the black hole people uh, stop doing taxonomy and start doing, you know, talking to the galaxy formation people, and the galaxy formation people tr stop treating black holes as if they're, you know, some weird thing that we don't have to care about. So, you know, these sorts of things, I think, really, really push the field forward. So that's something I would uh, encourage you to do. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, I don't have to say all this stuff again, but, um, yeah, I think, I think that there's, there's many different interesting physical processes that have to be explored. And the key message, I think, is while we have this sort of very broad brush, you know, heuristic picture of how galaxy formation works, we really have essentially n very little idea about what the actual physics is. Okay, and I think that's that's really where 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 of course we want to go. We don't necessarily just want to have a model that creates you know fake galaxies. We want to understand the physics, right? Uh, so that's that's I think where where I think uh, you know that that a lot of the work has been going, and particularly you know towards small scales understanding both the interstellar medium as well as understanding black hole accretion processes, and and understanding the, the creation of those types of uh, uh, feedback and uh, associated feedback. So. Uh, so that's, I think, where, where, the, where the field is really headed, is trying to break through some of these small-scale barriers and, and try to work towards a deeper understanding of what is the actual origin of, these, uh, of all these all this sort of outflows and inflows and all that. Thanks. Thank you, Ramil. Uh, uh, we had questions throughout, but um, are there other questions? Yeah, if you can push the button. Speak straight into it. Um, so my question is, is preventive feedback basically negative feedback, or is that different? Um, yes, I think that is the lingo, right? Uh, well, I think positive feedback means, feedback means, means stimulating star formation. The feedback usually means that you're preventing star formation yeah. or making star formation less right. efficient. But, exactly. I mean, there's ejective versus preventative, both of which yeah. are negative feedback. Both are negative, right. But ejective means you blow the gas exactly. out to prevent stars from forming, whereas preventative means you prevent the gas from coming in in the first place and thereby reduce star formation. I think you invented that. Uh, no, Neil did. Neil. Well, he, he invented velvet rope feedback yeah. versus uh, <laughs> bouncer feedback. So the bouncer feedback <laughs> kicks you out, whereas the velvet rope feedback <laughs> prevents you from getting in the club. Well, in principle, so. there is also a third <laughs> possibility that you have the gas, yeah. which is, comes in but doesn't form star because maybe it's ionized or something. Well, that's right. So that's, that's another type of preventive feedback, which, uh, yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, so. So preventive feedback can be in a lot of different places. There's certainly a lot of preventive feedback going on in the ISM, right? Because that's why star formation is so inefficient, 
Uh, so, so we know that happens, and we don't totally understand how that happens, and that could, as you say, be quite different under different physical conditions. Other questions? I shouldn't be asking questions. <laughs> you should. Not as, uh, as student-oriented these days, but in this respect, I sort of am. I'm, uh, uh, I thought it was a great talk, by the way, uh, very comprehensive. Um, so we have two paths, I'm trying to take both paths. One is uh, the simulations as numerical experiment with various control parameters, and the other one are these sort of global laws. Uh, and the global law ideas have sort of grown with extra parameters over time. And ultimately, one hopes that there will be get, get to be an interesting convergence of the two approaches where you've encapsulated the essence of the simulations. Um, part of that is to adequately deal with all of the fluctuations that occur around any sort of mean properties you might get from looking at an ensemble. So um, if you were forced, as I'm trying to force you to, looking downstream five years or so, where do you see all of that going, and do you see that we will actually have a fairly adequate uh, um, model in which you could just sort of lay the results down on end body simulations as opposed to requiring uh, the full up hydro? I hope, I certainly hope so. I, th I think, you know, I mean, I, think, I, I mean, the SAMs have already made a huge amount of progress towards this, but one of the things, that's a great point you brought, you brought up, because, um, you know, I think one of the futures of these sort of scaling relation ideas, right, is not the scaling relation themselves, but the scatter around the scaling relation. And actually that's kind of where the interesting physics ends up being, right? Um, so, yeah, so, you know, things like the fundamental metallicity relation, you know, that, that thing at a given mass, the star forming galaxies tend to lie at lower metallicity. Um, you know, you can, you can have similar uh, similar things for the gas fraction and so on and so forth. And again, I think that what these, what these highlight is this idea that, you know, we call our little simple model an equilibrium model. Why do we call it that? Because galaxies like to live at an equilibrium that is on these scaling relations. So any deviation, when you kick a galaxy off, the physics conspires to put them back on, right? And that's why these scaling relations like mass metallicity are so tight, right? So if you go off from here, you accrete a bunch of low metallicity gas, you, you, you don't gain in stellar mass, but you lower in metallicity, and you gain in gas content, which also boosts your star formation rate, right? So that's, that's how something like the fundamental metallicity relation might emerge from this sort of fluctuating inflow paradigm. Um, so yeah, so I, I completely agree that the, the, the interesting questions now, I think, to, for the models, for these simple models, is to see if we can get recover these, right? Because if we can recover those and really understand where those come from, now not only are we populating our in-body simulations, you know, just with the mean relations, but we're we're populating them way in a, in a way that that encapsulates the scatter and its dependence on whatever environment, you know, immediate accretion rate, et cetera. Can I just do a quick follow-up on that? Mm -hmm. Uh, I like this idea that there are attractors and that you are f essentially going back with relative perturbations into the attractor basins. And then the issue is how many attractor uh, minima there are and uh, do you kick over? I mean, it presents a really interesting forward theoretical vision for the subject if it can be proved. Uh, do you think that that's probably going to emerge? Well, I think Rachel is better suited well, okay. to, Rachel, to me, right? I mean, I think I think the semi-lake models are certainly getting there, right? Uh, that they can they can certainly uh, predict these things in a fairly sophisticated way. Well, I'm, I'm thinking sort of a Langevin type approach where you fluctuate around and yeah. you sort of have this dive, that's yes, failing, and then you can fluctuate, but you can fluctuate over into another minimum if the fluctuations sort of build coherently enough. Is, is that it's part of the emerging picture, Rachel? Um, to some level. I don't know of any Has obvious... Has it been formulated in any way like that? 
I mean, the problem with this, the problem with this is that, you know, when we look at something like the mass metallicity relation, we don't see a second branch anywhere, ah, right? Okay. Um, we see a large scatter. What's what's that? So, sorry. So, the, of course, these are only star-forming galaxies, so then you would have to look at the stellar metallicities, of course, to look at the, the ellipticals, which do different things. <laughs> That's true. Um, the problem, you know, maybe metallicity isn't the best example because the calibrators are, are rel somewhat uncertain. Uh, so, but in principle, you should be able to match up the gas metallicities and the, and the, the stellar metallicities and put those on the same plot. When we do this in simulations, we can match roughly both the stellar and gas metallicities. Not great. Uh, other simulations do better than ours. Um, that uh, within a single paradigm that basically says that, okay, you know, once you, once you quench galaxies, you just start to evolve much more like a closed box, and so you start to just climb up in metallicity. Um, so I think that's, that's specific to metallicity, but I think your, your, your point is much more general than that. Um, and I think that the, the generic point would be that we would have to identify a uh, separate locus that things tend to be attracted to. And I would say that that's not obvious for many of the scaling relations yet. But again, there's lots of systematics. <coughs> Just to follow up on, on Dick's question, I think an example of what you're talking about is we think that galaxies grow along this star form, so-called star forming main sequence. The, na the whole name is sort of meant to represent that this is something fundamental. Of course, some people don't like that name, but you know, the galaxies grow in mass and star formation. And I think one of the puzzles is whether that is driven by cosmological conditions. Is it driven by accretion rates from large scales or is it driven by the physics of star formation on small scales? And I think you know, that's something we're still trying to work out is the interplay between the large scales and the small scales. That's sort of an overarching theme of actually the structure of this whole meeting um, that you might notice if you look at, at who the lecturers are. So that's not an accident. But then I think that there are processes like quenching, for example, that then clearly disconnect galaxies from that evolution along these, these sequences. And I think part of what's so complicated is that those sequences can be manifolds, right? So for example, we think metallicity there may be a fundamental plane that galaxies are evolving along, and it may even be more than, than just three dimensions, right? So there are these sort of high dimensional planes that I think galaxies evolve along and then perhaps detach from. And so understanding when, when they detach and why they're confined to these, to these manifolds, I think that's the really fundamental question. Should work. <coughs> so I was just thinking, um, if you think of some manifold and it has some, I think the idea is like the star forming main sequence is the attractor. Here, you need some for some attractor to happen. You need some dissipative process for it to work. What is that in this context? Just so, right. I, th I think the. You don't necessarily need a dissipative process. What you need is a process that forgets its previous condition in the sense of, so in the context of galaxies, you know, you can think about, um, you know, why, why do things evolve back towards, let's say, mass metallicity or stellar mass, gas mass fraction? And the, and the answer is, when you sort of look, is that it evolves back on a time scale corresponding to you know, growing by twice in its mass. Right? So effectively, once it sort of forgot about its previous perturbation right, by accreting a whole bunch more, that new accretion occurs in a way that puts it back onto the relation, and that kind of helps it go back. Right? So it's the stochastic averaging, essentially. In fact, you know, people have talked about this as an origin for the, the, the main sequence, um, uh, but it's I mean, you can explain it mathematically that way, that, that essentially there's an attractor solution and basically, uh, you know, your stochasticity will tend to average things out and you'll get a, sorry? It's a stable point. It's a stable point, that's right. And so, uh, but that doesn't, of course, tell you the physics, which is the more interesting aspect of it. But 
yeah, so I think the dissipation here, if you want to think about it, a dissipative term, I guess, is just um, the continued growth of the galaxy in a way that is decoupled from its previous evolution, right? Um, so you end up just averaging. Okay, so I think um, we've gotten to uh, a break. Uh, so let's uh, thank Ramil again. Uh, and we'll take a half hour break, so we'll be back here at 11.30.